Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were setting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire, very similar to what they saw in the Old Testament, uh, that separated and came to rest on each one of them, every single one of them, each one of them, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. How many of them? All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. You want to see the glory of God fall? You've got to be in church. Pastor in the church, uh, what should that look like? And you know, there are a million books on how to have a successful, growing church. But there's only one book that I trusted for my study, and you can probably guess that it was the Word of God, right? Because there is a powerful church spoken of in the Word of God that I think that we have kind of lost touch with over the last few years. So, a uh, few years, few decades, you, you know what I'm saying. Uh, so I got this, this little uh, game up here. How many of you know what this game is called? Jenga. All right. My sister got my kids this game for Christmas. It's really cool. It's like oversized Jenga. So the loser gets a concussion. It's really neat. It's really neat how it works. So here we have it. The church in unity, right? So I'm not very good at this game. If you've ever been near me, I do not have steady hands and I drink a lot of coffee. But if this thing falls, Sermon's over, all right? I, I can't finish it. If this, I thought about having somebody else. See, I, I, are you steady, Levi? Oh, not good at this game. So, so here's what we got. We got unity, and then we got, oh, do you see that shaking? Do they have medicine for this? So we have unity in the church, right? Or we have what I like to call, and I titled my sermon this, the unit why? The unit why? Now, some of you are unit wise in the church. And the more unit wise, oh, not that one. <laughs> not that one. Not that one. I, oh, this is a, no, it's too low. Too low, right? I feel like I'm on, I feel like I'm on the, the price is right. You're like, no, not that one. No, this, this uh, ah! Right, so so we got so we got unit. Oh man, who made this game? Uh, I gotta find a loose one. Thank you. <laughs> There's always that person. I think that's against the rules. Probably is. Probably. So, uh, unity, unit wise, right? Unit wise, you make our job really hard as pastors, right? Unit wise, you are the people that say, why do I have to be in church every Sunday? Why do I have to go to Sunday school? Why do my kids have to be involved in kids' programs? Why do I need to do all my quiet times every week? Why should I stay in that Sunday school class? Why should I be a part of Journey, right? I'm so busy. You just love to be over here all by yourself. Now look at this. This is a nice block, even though it's a different size than all the rest of those, obviously. You know, because this way it's hard to come out. <laughs> But you ask, why, 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 why? So let me, let me read you the definition of a unit. i got to find it in my notes. I'm all over the place already. An individual thing or person regarded as single and complete, but which can also form an individual part of a larger or more complex whole. So you love to look at yourself as a unit. I'm a unit. Why? The unit why? And unit wise, you come in and out, and in and out. And every time you come back in, what, you ever try to push a Jenga piece back in? What happens? It'll fall over. Now you can get them back in. Oh, oh. See what happens? People start to get what? A little, little bit out of shape. Because you bring in your different standard 
for the church. Your why. You know, your questions of why isn't just your thing. You question the leadership of the church. You question the mission of the church. You question what we think are the qualifications for a church to be successful. We have Wednesday nights because we want the church to be successful. We want you to be successful. We want the gospel to spread. So you're a unit Y, and you get, you get things all just, duh. I hate this game. Oh, oh, look at that, look at that, look at that. So when one comes back in, someone else comes back out. And it's so hard to get you all working together for the same purpose, for the same mission, because sometimes you're not here, other times you are. And it makes it really complicated. So if I was to take these blocks and I was to pass them out, I won't because concussions, right? What good would this game be if you all just took your block and went home? Now, you got a nice, nice block here for sharp edges. You could use it to hold down papers on your table, mail, things like that. You could maybe carve it into your own thing. And some of us just love to be out here. Some of us like to be seen. Some of us like to be noticed. Some of us are just too busy for what's going on over here in the church. So now that this one's gone, then this one wants to come back out because it's Wednesday. We don't do Wednesdays. My family don't. And you see what happens? The church just kind of becomes a little more vulnerable every time a unit Y pulls out and comes back in. And so the, so the staff and the leadership, we got to try to square this thing back up when you push in and you pull out. And it starts to lean and it starts to tilt. It gets dangerous. And people get concussions and stuff, right? So then the unit Y will decide it's time for our family to gather and come to church. We'll go to church today because Grandpa's sick and we really need the Lord to work, but we're only going to go at 1030 because that's what we need. So you shift back in, and things are unstable. And that's not how the church was designed to function. It's not what God has called us to be. And I believe, firmly believe, we have to stop blaming the government, the schools, the society for our modern-day issues. God designed his church to meet the needs of the people. America has a God problem because the church has a God problem. Schools have a God problem because the church has a God problem. Our teenagers have God problems because their parents have God problems. You desire to be outside of the church. So I'm thinking about my sermon while I'm leading worship because I'm ready to preach yesterday. You know how that goes. And we're singing these songs. Uh, what was the first one we sang? I forgot. Tracy, help me out here. The lion and the lamb. He's coming on the clouds. Every knee's going to bow. Our God is a lion. And, and the song talks about being set free. And I'm watching out here. I'm watching the congregation sing. And y'all sing so well. Y'all sing so well. But I'm wondering if someone here is in captivity, uh, they're, they're stuck under this bondage, and they sit in this church, and they're listening to our congregation, and I wonder if they think, these people don't really think I can be set free. They really, I mean, look at how they sing. This person doesn't think I can be, why am I even here? Why am I even here? Do you understand, like, the unity of our worship, how we sing, how we exclaim this uh, to the heavens has an impact on the people around us in church? This is my Bible. And you stand here with your hands in your pockets. And someone looks at you and says, he don't believe the Bible either, just like me. See what I'm saying? You see how unity can have this huge effect on us? We can talk and we can preach and we can sing until we're blue in the face and shout until we lose our voices, but at some point we have to stop just talking the truth and we have to start living it together, 100%, all of us. 
So there are two powerful texts in Matthew uh, that give us a great insight into what the church is. Most of us are familiar with this text, and I think mostly because it's one of the most debated uh, scriptures uh, probably in the history of the Bible. Uh, so let's take a look at it. See if we can, we can show you. Of course, I'm going to cover one of the most controversial. Uh, well, but that'll be fine. So Matthew 16, 13 through 20. And I taught about this uh, when we talked about Israel on Wednesday nights. Uh, the unit wise that weren't here, uh, you can get a copy from Mike. Uh, so, so let's go ahead and read Matthew 16, 13 through 20. It says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who did he ask? His disciples, very good. Just making sure you're with me here. Who do people say that the Son of Man is? They replied. Who replied? They, yes, the disciples. Very good. Boy, you guys are good at this. Better than probably you are at Jenga, right? So some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say that I am? Now, this is where we start to get into a little bit of, uh, where does this go? So Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples, who? His disciples, not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Mm. So the question that Jesus asks in the Greek is in plural form, okay? We have to know this. So he's talking to the Disciples, he's asking the disciples a question, and they, as disciples, respond, right? So if Jesus was from the south, Jesus would have asked the disciples, who y'all say that I am? That's what he's asking here, right? So Peter steps out, and he responds, right? He responds, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. So what did Peter do there? This is important because this is all plural. Peter responded for who? The disciples. The question was asked of the disciples. Peter responded for the disciples, and all the disciples said what? Well, we don't know. They didn't say anything different. They didn't say anything more that needed to be wrote in Scripture. So we can assume, right, logically assume that Peter's answer was good enough for the rest of them. Right? Because John didn't say, well, and you're, well, I think you're, no, that was good. That was good enough. But let's not just assume, so let, let's keep digging. So this is where, this is where we're, we'll get into a little, and I'm not, I don't speak Greek at all at all. Uh, but I do know how to research, so this was my research. Let's go. Jesus says, and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, right? And then Peter got his pope gown, and he was just ready to go, right? First pope. No, not at all. That's not how it happened. And a lot of people believe that way. And a lot of you, I've heard a lot of you talk and said, well, this is you know where Peter became the rock of the church. No. Okay, here we go. So I tell you that you are Peter. Translates Peter, Petros. Petros, which means a stone or a boulder, right? So here we go. Peter, a stone, a boulder. He goes on. And on this rock, I will build my church. Now, the Greek doesn't use the same word, Peter, which means rock. And rock, which doesn't necessarily mean rock like Peter, because the Bible uses two different words. That's important. So Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. So the separate word used on the rock that, that Christ will build his church upon is Petra. So we have Petros, and we have Petra. Petra means a large mass of rocks. Pretty cool, huh? 
And he's talking to Peter, right? Peter's kind of the spokesman for the disciples. We know that not just from this passage, but from many other. Peter was probably the leader of the disciples. He was the dominant one. He was one of these. Peter was one of these. And this is why Jesus, I think, is specifically talking to Peter. And he's saying, Peter, you are Peter. Peter, you're a stone. But on a cluster of rocks which is what Petra means. I'm going to build my church. It's going to take more than you, Peter. It's going to take you. It's going to take James. And it's going to take John. It, this is what he's saying. So, so we know like Peter's, Jesus is addressing Peter because Peter can kind of get in his own way sometimes. But, but Jesus doesn't take away the stoniness of Peter. He doesn't take away the in, individualness of Peter. But he's telling the disciples that his plans are much bigger than the stoniness of one man. I'm not laying this all on Peter's shoulders. This is for all y'all. His church the one that will not be overcome is an assembly of united stones. It'd be a funny church sign, wouldn't it? <laughs> but see, the stones must become rocks. It's the unity that makes it strong. So we're now called to be the New Testament. We are called to be the assembly of rocks. And this is important, and Peter learned this lesson, and I believe it's why Peter is kind of singled out in his stoniness in this conversation. Satan can overcome stones. If you're a unit Y, you can be defeated. You can be overcome. We know this because Peter denied Christ three times. Three times, but the church didn't fall. Because Satan can't overcome the assembly of rocks. It's a good thing there was more than just Peter who heard Jesus say, on this cluster, I'll build my church. So uh, I, I was reading, and this is where we all like to start. We all like to start in Acts. We want to be the Acts 2 church. We want to see the things that they saw. We want to have the impact that the Acts 2 church had. Amen? Amen. All right. So we always start in Acts 2 where it says the day of Pentecost came. They were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And we just pray, Lord, this is what I want. This is what we need. We just need some Sunday morning when almost everybody's here, we need your glory to fall down and fill this place. I don't think it's going to happen that way. I just don't think it's going to happen that way. So we, we read Acts 2 and we're like, well, what's the prerequisite, right? What has to take place in order for that to take place? That's what I want to know. What do we got to do before Acts 2. So Acts uh, does have a story written before it, and it's in Luke. Uh, and and I, just, I just wrote this down this morning, Tracy, so I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, it's, it's not even in my notes. Uh, so Luke, I want to go to 24. Twenty four. It's the, the last, the end of twenty four. I'm gonna start in verse fifty. So this is the ascension of Jesus. He's died, he's been resurrected, he's revealed himself to the church. Verse fifty When he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshipped him. And returned to Jerusalem with great joy. It's defining, defining uh, characteristic of the church, right? Great joy. And they stayed continually at the temple, praising God. All right? So the book of Luke, so who, who wrote the book of Luke? Man, scholars, y'all. Now, tricky question here. Who wrote Acts? 
Luke. Wow. Very good. So if we want to know about the Acts 2 church and how they got to where they were, we should read what Luke wrote before he wrote Acts, right? So Luke begins with the praising of God in the temple and ends with the praising of God in the temple, and then we get to Acts when the day of Pentecost came. So they were together in the temple. They had been together in the temple. They were united when the day of Pentecost came. They were all together in one place, and nobody was surprised. Nobody's like, hey, we just went through the list, and everybody's here. Lord, everybody's here. Glory can fall, right? But hurry up, because lunch is at noon. No, it wasn't that way. So, so read this again with the thought of the people gathered in the temple, gathered in the temple, gathered in the temple, gathered in the temple. Expectation, 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 expectation. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place because that's what the church does. That's what the church does. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were setting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire, very similar to what they saw in the Old Testament, uh, that separated and came to rest on each one of them, every single one of them, each one of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. How many of them? All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. You want to see the glory of God fall? You've got to be in church. You've got to be in church. If you're not in church, then you're not the church. You can't love God and not love his people. You cannot do it. Ephesians 2, 19 through 22. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. Okay, so if you got home today and someone took all of your windows out of your house, it's not going to do you much good, right? Right? Or if we took your roof off. How about that? Yeah, all this rain we've been getting. So members of his household built on the foundation. Get this. Oh, Built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and raises to become a holy temple of the Lord. Not if you're over here being your own little thing. Not if. Joined together and raises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Why are we here? Because we are becoming a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. That's why you're here. We're not finished yet. We're not finished yet. We are called as stones into this beautiful, powerful assembly with the chief cornerstone of Christ Jesus. Build upon the apostles and the saints and I can be a piece of that. I don't even care where my stone falls. Put me in the back. Put me facing the wrong direction. I just want to touch a part of this assembly that is being put together that the glory of God might fill. Your kid's sport does not outdo the glory of God filling the church. It does not. Your need for your own time does not outdo the temple being brought together. 
and I get, I get on this all the time, but it drives me crazy. Oh, the school's having something on Sunday again. Sure it is. You all go to it. Don't go. If the church don't go, they say, hey, there's a lot of people that don't come to our things on Sunday. Maybe we should move it to Saturday. But it doesn't end there. I, we gotta, we got to finish Matthew 16. We have to. Because this is what happens when the glory of God fills the temple, right? I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Here's the keys, church. Who brought the keys today? <laughs> Who brought, there's nothing more frustrating than getting to the church and forgetting my keys at home. That's why it's nice that Dad and Mike live close by. Come let me in. But I wonder this. How are there so many churches in America and we're still losing? We're still losing. Nothing's being bound. Nothing's being loosed. Why? We got church keys, that's why. And it's the kingdom keys that bind and loose. Church, we have a sign right out here in our yard. We have a bigger sign on the wall and a smaller sign over here. And they all say what? Free. We are a free Christian church. We are a free Christian cluster of rocks, right? That's what we're supposed to be. So that means when somebody comes in this church that looks different than us, acts different than us, we embrace them. Because what if they're the stone we were missing to finish the temple? So when someone walks into this church, I might see them as someone who can be free. And you might see them as someone who could be set free. And we might pray for them and we might shake their hand. But to be honest with you, it only takes one person who doesn't. One person who isn't unified with us. The cornerstone still stands. The apostles still stand. But do you see how many people missed it because of you?